Uh, good morning to you. Welcome to the CNBC Africa special broadcast in partnership with the National Rail Regulator of South Africa. My name is Fifi Peters. In the next hour, we will be weaving through the state of our rail systems and the impact that COVID-19 has had on operations as well as security. Prior to the pandemic, our rail networks already experienced uh, several challenges around theft, vandalism, as well as delays, and this against a backdrop of a poorly maintained infrastructure. We do know that a fully functioning rail system will be critical to keeping the economy's rebound from the pandemic-induced recession on track. And so we'll be speaking to industry experts about their plans and their efforts to improve the rail network. We do invite you as our viewers and our audience uh, tuned in virtually to share your thoughts and any questions that you may have with us throughout the discussion. We will get through as many as time Time does allow. But uh, let us get going. Uh, before we do uh, introduce our es esteemed uh, speakers to delve deeper into this year's report, let's welcome our first uh, speaker for the introductory remarks. And that is uh, South Africa's uh, Deputy Minister of Transport, Ms. Cindy Siwe Lydia Chikunga who will be giving us an overview of the State of Safety report for the 2021 financial year. Uh, Deputy Minister, ma'am, good morning. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Program Director. Uh, Chairperson of the Railway Safety Regulator, RSR, Board of Directors, Mr. B.J. Nobunga. Members of the RSR Board of Directors, DDG for Rail, Mr. Ngwako Makaipia, Acting CEO of the RSR, Mr. Muso Silaledi, CEOs of Rail Operators, SADEC Railway Operators represented, SARA members, DOT and RSR Senior Management, esteemed panel members, all rail operators and stakeholders present, members of the media, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Program Director, allow me to profusely thank the RSR for hosting this year's State of Safety Report launch. Just a few weeks ago, the Minister of Transport, Honorable Fikile Mbalula, launched a transport month in Pochefstrom at the Samba Sonke Road Maintenance Project. At this occasion, he reiterated that the transport is a key enabler to South Africa's economic recovery and reconstruction. This includes rail transport, and is underscored by government's medium-term strategic framework that puts the spotlight on building a stronger economy for our country. As per international standards and code of practice on rail, to have a functional and effective rail service, you need a sound and robust regulatory regime. In the South African context, the RSR exists for the reason to oversee, promote, monitor, and enforce railway safety within the Republic to ensure that our railway environment is underpinned by a safe regulatory regime. Consequentially, as a mandatory requirement, the regulator is required to release the state of, of, of safety report annually in compliance with section 20 of the National Railway Safety Regulator Act number 16 of 2002 as amended. Program director, the state of safety report provides an analysis of operational occurrences and security related incidents and helps us to understand the overall profile of risk in the railways. It also provides a snapshot of safety across the rail sector and identifies the main areas thereby enabling the regulator and operators to develop strategic interventions to address the areas that need attention. This year's report is presented against the backdrop of a world altering pandemic, as you have said, program director. The impact of the COVID-19 pandemic led to major operators across the country producing significantly fewer train kilometer than in previous years. This has resulted in a 38 decrease in combined traffic levels of TFR, Prasa and Hau train. Moreover, during the lockdown, operators experienced a considerable rise in theft and vandalism. This set off a decrease in return on investment for major operators who had to spend millions of rents to repair vandalized rail infrastructure. The situation is further exacerbated by the fact that commuters are opting for alternative transport. As a result, 
as a direct result of the current state of our rail system. When interrogated, commuters decry the lack of security, train delays, limited train services as the main reasons. All these factors impacting the landscape of the rail industry force us to shift our thinking and become the impetus for incremental innovative solutions. The regulator had to adapt and adjust the way it conducted audits and inspections by imploring technology solutions such as drones and virtual audits. Operators too had to make changes to accommodate the new normal. Considering both the positive and negatives, we must admit that the railway sector is finding itself in uncharted territory. Program director, the comparative analysis of the statistics between the reporting period, which is 2020-21, and the previous year, which is 2019-20, are as follows. Operational occurrences decreased by 40% during 2020-21. Security-related incidents decreased by 19%. The workforce was harm free in 40% of operational occurrences, while the public was harm free in 26% of occurrences, compared to 14.29% recorded the previous year, which is 2019 2020. The report indicates a 15% decrease in total train derailment and 30% reduction in level crossing occurrences that were recorded from 2019 20 to 2020 2021. The long-term level, cro level crossing occurrences decreased by 52% overall since 2010-11. That's recording the lowest figure. Program director, while we see some positive statistics, this is not yet cause for celebration because the combined traffic levels of TFR, Prasa, and Train declined by 38% since 2019-2020 and 53% Six, since 2010-11. However, during the 2020-21 reporting period, operators only reported 3% fewer occurrences and 31% more security-related incidents despite the decline. And this is cause for concern. Program director, even though collusions and derailments depict a year-on-year -year decrease, which we are appreciating, but when you consider the normalized figures which take into consideration the train kilometers, these show an increase. People struck by trains and platform train interface indicate a significant decrease. However, this happened during the year when passenger activity was restricted across the railways. For persons illegally crossing the railway lines, there is a reduction of 84.79%, which is in figures 426 incidents in 2020-21, compared to 2,801 in 2019-20. These numbers attest to the fact that we must stay focused and ensure that through our collective efforts, we concretely drive down the number of occurrences and prioritize the safety of both commuters and workforce in our operations. It is for this reason that the regulator has intensified monitoring and enforcement of safety and security plans of the various operators. However, this is not enough. More collaboration is essential if you want to truly turn the situation around. It will require the collective efforts of all stakeholders, commuters, communities living adjacent to the railway lines, our law enforcement agencies, and you, the public, to be our eyes and ears so that we can address the devastation of our rail infrastructure. I believe that let's all work together to keep our rail network on track. I thank you very much, Program Direct. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Minister, uh, for that, uh, setting the scene and uh, providing the context uh, for us. Uh, at this stage, I'd like to uh, bring in uh, the experts who will be driving into the detail of uh, the uh, report, uh, industry exports, uh, experts rather in charge of moving passengers and cargo across our national rail networks. Starting with Mr. Boy Johannes Nobunga, Chairperson of the Rail Safety Regulators. Mr. Muso Silaledi, Acting CEO of the Railway Safety Regulator. Mr. William Dax, a CEO of Gautrain Management Agency. 
Ms. Sizakele Mzimela, Chief Executive of Transnet Freight Rail, and uh, Mr. Zolani Matthews, a Group CEO of the Passenger Rail Agency of South Africa. Well, good morning to you all. Uh, quite excited to get into the uh, detail of the report. And Johannes, I'd like to begin with you. Just picking up from what the uh, Deputy Minister uh, did uh, tell us, the fact that uh, we do have operational occurrences that are lower, security uh, incidences that are lower. If you look at it at a headline level, but of course when we normalize the figures, things are going in the wrong direction. Uh, just talk to us about the state of the rail uh, system in South Africa and why, why we are seeing things going in the wrong direction. Well, thank you very much, uh, Fifi. Good morning, uh, Deputy Minister, and good morning, uh, uh, CEOs and uh, uh, leaders in the rail sector. I, I think it is important uh, to note uh, that uh, the first uh, thing uh, to indicate is that uh, we have uh, the challenges that uh, were imposed on us uh, in the rail uh, industry by the COVID-19 uh, uh, regulations and the lockdowns uh, uh, that uh, were imposed uh, on uh, all South Africans uh, owing to uh, the emergence of the pandemic. That led to a situation where, in uh, number one, the issue of security in uh, the rail sector was lexed. Uh, because of the lockdown, and that they uh, had uh, a, a significant impact on the issue of the security of the uh, rail uh, infrastructure, uh, which uh, I think we all are aware, as indicated even in the previous report, uh, that we have seen a significant increase in uh, uh, security-related uh, vandalism and theft of uh, infrastructure, which feeds into the overall performance uh, uh, of uh, the sector. So that is the one uh, most important factor uh, that is making us uh, to go the wrong direction. The second one, of course, uh, is uh, the issue uh, that relates to the reduction uh, of uh, uh, the need by the public to utilize uh, the, race, the rail uh, uh, the passenger rail in particular, uh, because uh, of uh, the various levels of uh, lockdown, uh, which uh, uh, in, 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 in a way left uh, the rail sector uh, without uh, visible activities, which then uh, makes it uh, vulnerable uh, for would-be uh, 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 people that they would... Uh, uh, target uh, the sector for their own uh, uh, nefarious uh, activities. And then, of course, uh, the issue of uh, having uh, people uh, in the uh, space uh, uh, operating from home, uh, which therefore meant uh, that uh, even uh, uh, some of uh, our engineers and technical people that are supposed to be out there in the field, they are not out there in the field all at the same time. There are those uh, uh, that should be taking turns, and as a result, uh, that would uh, also impact or negatively on uh, the uh, management uh, of uh, the uh, sector as as as, as a whole. Uh, we we must also indicate uh, that uh, the issue of uh, the huge uh, uh, increase uh, of uh, almost uh, two hundred and forty percent. Of these security related incidents. It's a great worry to us as RSR, and I, 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 I assume that uh, it's not a worry only to RSR, but it is also a worry to all the other operators uh, because uh, if you have uh, such a huge uh, a, a jump uh, uh, on the issue of uh, security related uh, incidents, uh, uh, then uh, it says to you. Uh, that uh, as uh, the sector, we are not doing enough to ensure that we become proactive uh, in uh, uh, reducing uh, these uh, uh, incidents uh, that they are making uh, the sector not to attract uh, uh, people to come and utilize it, particularly 
when we talk about issues uh, of uh, the passenger rail in particular. Uh, Musa, just uh, to jump in there, uh, would you say that uh, the pandemic diluted the efficacy of previous interventions to try and improve rail safety and that you are expecting things uh, to become a little bit uh, better as we emerge from the pandemic and the various lockdowns? Or uh, did it amplify the situation? And if it has, what is the uh, rail safety regulator looking to do differently uh, to nip this challenge in the bud? Well, uh, as, as, as I've indicated, uh, that the fact that you have many of uh, our uh, people operating from home uh, that are supposed to be ensuring that uh, there is compliance at all times uh, has had a significant impact on the issue of uh, safety. And now that uh, things are almost moving uh, to normalcy, uh, driven by the fact that uh, uh, we are more levels down than where we were uh, a few months ago, and also given the fact uh, that uh, many of uh, our population is uh, vaccinating, we hope uh, that uh, that would uh, begin to uh, drive us to a point where we go back uh, to uh, the programs that we had put in place to ensure uh, that uh, we improve on the issue of safety in uh, the sector. And we believe uh, that uh, with uh, that kind of uh, intervention, uh, we would uh, then be able uh, to see a significant uh, uh, improvement that would take us uh, uh, to levels uh, above uh, the ones we had uh, before the pandemic, because we were beginning to, to move to the right direction. Uh, but uh, because uh, of uh, those challenges, we then uh, regressed uh, in the manner in which uh, we're trying to intervene to ensure the safety of the sector. Okay. Okay, so thanks uh, for, for, for explaining. William, just to bring you in here, can you give us uh, the experience of the Khao train and uh, what the state of uh, safety and security is looking like at the Khao train? What kind of challenges you experienced uh, in this uh, financial year? William, sir, you are on a mute. The infamous statement <laughs> used throughout um, this pandemic. Sorry, uh, there, uh, there we go. Uh, perfect. So I think from a how train perspective, the impact has largely been, as the Deputy Minister and the RSR Board Chair indicated, in terms of the number of passengers. Um, we are also very optimistic about the state we are in now in terms of vaccination levels uh, return to normalcy. So I think we, we're positive about, about the future. From a safety point of view, we're very proud we've been able to keep our, our, our safety and security levels intact. There definitely have been challenges around um, asset security. You know, the cable theft scenario remains a constant, a constant threat. Um, we've been quite successful, I think, in preventing successful cable theft um, through, an, through a number of measures, but the number of attempts still remains, still remains quite, um, quite high. And I think also we just need to reflect on perhaps the opportunity that the lower levels of ridership have given us at, at car trains. So we've run fewer trains and fewer passenger kilometers, but we've been able to use that time to to just improve on our asset maintenance regime, just to make sure that our system really is set up that as passengers return to um, to, to using the car train, that the system's there, it's ready, it's safe, and it'll be able to, to continue where it was pre-pandemic. Mm. Uh, to bring you in, Zolani, to give us the uh, perspective of Prasa, uh, just the cost perhaps that some of the uh, security incidences over the past year have cost you and whether you, like the Khao train, have used the opportunity in which you have experienced uh, fewer passengers using your trains uh, to uh, improve on maintenance. Uh, well, Ms. Peters, I think, uh, and, and good morning to the Deputy Minister and the colleagues uh, on the panel, I think from the perspective of Prasa, 
We face an entirely different range of, of problems that are, that, that are well known uh, in that uh, we have had to rebuild or we are in the process of rebuilding the entire uh, uh, infrastructure. The network suffered a, uh, had consistently not had the kind of capital investment that it required pre-COVID. And then during COVID, when it was uh, closed uh, for five months, we saw, we saw high incidents of theft and vandalism uh, on, on the network and, and on the infrastructure across the country. This has meant that we've had to focus a lot of time and effort into rebuilding the infrastructure while we've had not had the ability to run enough train sets to consistently be able to provide a, a regular service. Added to that, the removal of the security companies during the period just prior to COVID hitting has been a major contributory factor to the decline in, 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 in our ridership the inability to provide adequate services. So we're in a process at this point of restoring the critical services that, uh, that, uh, that we need to, uh, to have back uh, as PRASA, but also to rebuild the network. So it's a combination of factors for us that are vastly different from those that are faced by how train and, and, and to an extent uh, TFR itself, in that we run a much larger uh, commuter-based network, but it has its own share of problems and challenges that the RSR, I think, is, is, is well acquainted with and has been of great value in terms of assisting us in a number of critical areas. So our problems are, are, are markedly different, and the challenges that we face, particularly from a security perspective, are challenges that, we're going, that are going to be with us for some time and that are going to take us a, 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 a period where we've got to stabilize uh, the network as well as stabilize the business, which is going to be core to our ability to be uh, to run an effective uh, train service over a period of time. But security is going to be there. The, the issues that uh, Mr. Dak has just alluded to in terms of cable theft and other such uh, uh, challenges are ongoing. And so we are introducing a much more comprehensive uh, security strategy that is aimed at reinforcing the security that we already have, but working in conjunction with, with uh, some of the other SOEs, such as ESCOM and Transnet and Telcom, to confront some of these challenges are going to be some of the strategies that we're going to utilize. Right. Uh, Sizakela, just your opening remarks, ma'am, on the uh, impact of COVID-19 on Transnet uh, freight uh, rail. I think that uh, we, as the media, have been monitoring some of the interventions that, that Transnet has tried to make in this period, all the arrests that you have tried to make, all the whistleblowing stations that you've also uh, tried to put in place to curb the uh, situation of safety at uh, TFR. But to give us a picture of what the situation has looked like. Well, good morning, Ms. Peters, and good morning, Deputy Minister, um, the Chairman of the RSR and the railway uh, colleagues. So uh, I think as the Transnet Freight Rail, we've had a um, slightly different experience uh, during the, um, the lockdown. And in that, uh, firstly, from the movement of, of, of actual moving of trains, we were obviously affected as well under lockdown five, but we were still moving because uh, essential goods uh, for the first few months. Uh, and during that period, strangely enough, we saw very little incidents of theft and vandalism. But as soon as we started to move down um, to level four, three, and, and so forth, we saw an increase in the number of incidents of, of theft and vandalism on our line. So we have been very um, uh, vocal uh, that, you know, if you look at just the trend for the last five years, we've seen an increase of 177% and um, in terms of theft and vandalism on, of our, on our line, which has a significant impact on our ability to be able to move uh, the critical export volumes that the country requires us to be exporting um, at, at this point in, in, in time. Um, in, if I talk about numbers, I mean, right now, I mean, in terms of um, number of incidents pertaining to cable theft, it's around about 300 incidents per month. But if we take all incidents in a month, it actually grows up to about 600 uh, number because it would then include uh, the theft of uh, key in infrastructure such as substations and, and signaling systems that then would have a negative impact on uh, what we're able um, to move on, on the track. So yes, I mean, we have been fortunate from, uh, from a freight business perspective that we've had the ability to continue to operate 
the, during all of the, the different le levels uh, of the pandemic, uh, but we've just seen an increasing uh, challenge in relation uh, to the amount of theft, which has had an impact of what we've been able to actually uh, uh, deliver from a, a volume uh, expectation. There are initiatives that we've been uh, undertaking and much aligned to what the minister also indicated initially that we've had to increase uh, our use of technology. So we use, make more use of technologies uh, like uh, the drone uh, at this stage. And I mean, we've had to actually increase the number of people that actually support us on the ground. And that has led to a significant increase on how much security is actually costing us as an organization. Just in this last year, we had to spend uh, in excess of 1.6 billion just to make sure that we're protecting the line as far as possible and in order uh, to ensure um, the, the safe movement uh, of the, the commodities. But then just going back again to a talk, uh, topic around the overall safety um, of the rail infrastructure, I think when uh, in terms of that, indeed, uh, even as, as transfer freight rail, we have seen um, a declining uh, trend in operational in incidents um, of safety on the main line. But what does continue, continue to be a, an area of concern um, is the increase in, in the rail uh, reserve encroachments onto our line and the increasing number of level uh, crossings on the line. Because I think all of us would agree that even one life lost is one life too many. And uh, if we speak about having lost uh, already in this year, 10 people um, on level crossings, that is a significant number in my view. Thanks. No, thanks, ma'am. And I think that uh, the panel, the rest of the panel will certainly agree there. But uh, Muso, just to get your opening thoughts here, because we are talking about a situation in which we have experienced, you know, a decline and a significant decline in um, operational occurrences. But we still have quite a number that had took place over the year. I mean, we're looking around at over 10,000 negative uh, incidences or 10,000 negative events, which is which is quite a big number. But nonetheless, just looking at this uh, number, there's a question that has come through from the audience about how uh, the uh, rail safety is measured. And the question says, does the uh, RSR consider the uh, current evaluation of the rail industry state of safety where the focus is exclusively on occurrences as giving a realistic picture of the actual state of safety across the industry? And Musa, that question is to you. Well, good morning, Ms. Peters. Good morning to the Deputy Minister, the Chairperson of the Board and the fellow CEOs and your audience that has joined us today. That is a fair question, but first things first, our responsibility as the Deputy Minister is outlined is to report in line with our act, which requires us on an annual basis to report the statistics relating to occurrences, both in the operational occurrences and the safety related occurrences. So as a start, we do need to report on the year that has transpired and to do a comparative analysis year on year and over a trend to identify where we are, almost as a dipstick to be able to know exactly where we are. Yes, the question is fair. Is that the best way to measure it? Based on the instruments we have at our disposal, that is how, as a regulator, we have seen fit and best to do that. You members will recall that we do have the occurrence reporting categories where operators are required to report occurrences in the various categories, both for operational and security. And based on that, we then derive the stats that we use to measure the railway industry. Going forward though, we are working on a signature project around our safety risk model, where we will use the same data elements and introduce precursors rather than looking back, look at precursors to plot the industry by risk and plot all operators by risk. And that may in fact be a better way, but we're still working on that initiative. And as it stands now, the report, uh, the annual state of safety report is how we analyze the industry and report year on year back uh, as required through our act. Thank you. All okay. right. Th thanks. Thanks, Musa, for the uh, response. Uh, there's another question that has come through from uh, the audience and it's guiding us in the direction of uh, 
tabling uh, solutions and uh, perhaps stronger interventions that can help the situation around safety on South Africa's rail networks. And Deputy Minister, the question is actually directed to you specifically, ma'am. Uh, the uh, respective person would like to know your impressions of the general state of rail safety and the interventions that can be made. Thank you very much. Um, I, I think the chairperson of the board uh, presented the reality and I think other CEOs as well the reality of what happened during the year that we are report, we're reporting about, that is 2020-2021, to say it was at the time when we had restricted movements and, and, and many people staying at home. However, of course, if we look on what has happened since 2010-2011, it does not give us the impression that we are doing well in dealing with issues of safety and security in the rail sector. And, 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 and what I think should happen is for the regulator to actually effectively implement its mandate as prescribed in the, in the legislation. That of overseeing, of promoting, of monitoring, but enforcing railway safety within the Republic. And it has to do that so that operators can then present to it their plans, security plans, they are safety plans, but also ensure that they get implemented. And if they don't, of course, be penalized for that, because I think that that's, that's one way of ensuring that things get done. We understand the situation, and, and the group CEO of PRASA is indicating the fact that we've had challenges for quite a long time. As a matter of fact, the challenges that we have in the rail sector, particularly in the passenger rail sector, they date back to 80s when, of course, the, the De Villiers Commission said the apartheid government must not invest on railway on railway services. And to the extent from 6 billion rent that was being invested at the time, it went down to about 600 million rent by the time it was in the early 90s. And that had direct impact. And therefore, when the democratic government get, get, came into power, it found the railway, the railway services that were not invested on, that were old. And probably we took longer to, 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 to do something about that. So we are dealing with something that has been there for quite a long time, and, and we are trying to correct that. And therefore, we do have some challenges, safety challenges. We do have security challenges. But I believe that the operators that are here, and I'm happy that we have CEOs of big operators that are here, that we are expecting them to ensure that the plans that they have get implemented and that they will accept the authority of the regulator, that of monitoring, of promoting, of enforcing, if they've got to enforce that which they've got to do. All right. All right. Thanks, ma'am. Uh, Johannes, uh, just uh, responding to what the deputy minister uh, has said, uh, essentially calling on uh, the regulator to uh, strengthen its hand in implementing its uh, mandate to ensure rail safety. What are your plans in that regard? Well, the, the first uh, thing that uh, becomes important is the CF, the Acting CEO has indicated uh, that uh, we have to uh, put our focus on ensuring that uh, uh, the issue of uh, the model that we are utilizing should be a model that uh, is in a position to be forward looking and uh, trying to resolve the risks uh, that they uh, are identified uh, instead of uh, uh, being reactive and acting to a data that uh, is uh, uh, talking to the past. And then the, the other thing, of course, uh, that uh, becomes important to us is uh, for the sector to be looking at uh, the two main important areas. The first one is the issue of uh, infrastructure, which amongst others also includes the issue of uh, the rolling stock uh, that uh, we are having in, 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 in the sector. If we address that particular issue of ensuring that we have a reliable infrastructure uh, that uh, is in a position to uh, ensure that uh, we avert uh, any 
a negative uh, a, 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 a results uh, that come out of uh, uh, the various operators within the uh, industry itself. And then the, the second issue that we have to look at is the issue of uh, the safety. Uh, because uh, if you look at uh, the problems uh, that we having uh, that uh, relates to uh, vandalism and theft, uh, they speak uh, to the kind of uh, safety measures that we put in place in the sector uh, to ensure that we guide uh, the infrastructure uh, that we are having. If uh, we have uh, uh, those elements under control, we are of the firm view uh, that we would then be able to have a reliable a rail sector that they would uh, be in a position uh, to make us to achieve uh, our objective as a country uh, of uh, providing a reliable uh, passenger uh, rail for our commuters and also ensuring that uh, we uh, 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 assist government in the objective of moving a uh, road to rail because uh, we would be having a uh, infrastructure that uh, it's a uh, giving confidence uh, to investors uh, that uh, through rail, uh, their cargo would be able uh, to uh, move from one point to the other. Okay, let's uh, then uh, focus specifically then on infrastructure and plugging the gaps, given that it has been mentioned quite prominently. Uh, William, just your, your take here on plugging the infrastructure uh, gaps. Uh, what, in your view, or where, in your view, are the opportunities here to invest further in our rail infrastructure and to uh, crowd further private sector investments? Fifi, it'll be a different answer from different operators. From a hard train perspective, what we want to do, what we need to do, is to grow our footprint. You know, we think we're a a very good economic intervention in, in Gauteng. Um, we've got a proven ability to connect people to work, um, economic hubs in the province, but we're not big enough. We don't have the scale where we can, where we can move people on a real network. So to me, that speaks to two points, growing the, the rail network in the province, and I think that's something that um, Sydney Prasa and and Gautrain are, are aligned on, would be aligned on. But I think also then in terms of integration with other modes of transport. So yes, this is rail and rail safety. But remember, we move people. We don't move um, people in one mode only. Um, so we've got to be able to have better integration with, for example, minibus taxis. And we've got to ask ourselves the question, is our infrastructure adequate for that? We've got to connect better to BRT systems. We've got to connect better to the future, which is probably e-hailing services. And we know for a fact that our infrastructure generally isn't designed for that sort of interoperability and, and integration. So those for me are some of the real challenges that we've got to, we've, we've got to face in terms of, of, of infrastructure. And then we mustn't forget about technology. You know, people's choices in terms of information that they can get, how they can move from one point to the other, is driven by cell phones, you know, mobile devices, apps, etc. So we've got to be also very aware of our need to invest in infrastructure that relates to information, to fair systems, so that people can, for example, pay fares in more innovative, innovative ways. There's a whole range of investments and interventions that we in the rail sector need, need to be doing. And yes, it may take five or 10 years, but certainly our view is that the planning and the thinking around that has got to be, has got to be starting right now. Yeah. And as you did say, I mean, this is a conversation about uh, a rail safety, but to your point around expansion, I think everyone is uh, well aware that, that it has been on the cards for the Gau train for some time. Can you just give us a progress update on how that is going, as well as the, uh, the drives and the steps to uh, integrate the uh, Gau train with uh, other uh, forms of transport more closely, like the taxis and the bus services? Fifi's absolutely. So, so starting with the efforts in, in terms of integration, you know, there's this fantastic, it's a real success story about how our train uh, 
integrates with minibus taxis now at four of our stations. So we have, instead of buying new big buses, we have contracts with minibus taxi associations to run uh, branded uh, minibuses that are owned by the minibus taxi associations. They get to keep the fare revenue. They bring passengers to and from the car train system. Fifi has been the most successful re post-COVID recovery part of, of, of the car train. I think ridership levels in those midi buses are back to about 75, 80% of pre-COVID. Pre and it, it really works. And it, it's, it's a success story because it crowds in what has always been regarded as the informal public transport operator, the, 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 the minibus taxi associations. And it's certainly a model that, that we are going to be taking, taking forward, especially when the, our current concession comes to an end. We don't really want to be in the business of owning buses. We think that many bus taxi associations can really play a big role there. In terms of the extension of the network itself, if you just a quick update, we're busy with the route determination for phase one. In other words, getting our first land rights um, over a route that would go from Santon through Randburg to Cosmo City. All right. Okay, thanks, William. Uh, Zulani, uh, then uh, the perspective from uh, Prasa here on infrastructure, just to give us a, uh, an indication of what your plans are uh, to uh, plug in the gaps, uh, where the gaps uh, presently are. Uh, and uh, to, to that point, a uh, question coming in from the audience, how much, how much you have spent on infrastructure in the recent while? Thank you, uh, Ms. Peters. First of all, let me say to, uh, to, 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 to my colleague, uh, uh, Mr. Dax, please, while I think competition is a good thing, don't come and poach from my area and I won't come and poach from your area. Um, we are uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, the blessing uh, of and the curse of having endured uh, years of uh, underdevelopment and, and, and no capital investment in our infrastructure is really allowing us to build a modern uh, uh, passenger rail system that is really fit for purpose. The, uh, uh, such an, one such example of this is the Gibella factory at Dunatar, which is building tra the new train sets, the EMU, the blue trains, uh, which we will soon be launching in particular in the Western Cape in an off-peak service. The RSR has granted us a permit to start that, uh, that service. But we are investing in major capital projects uh, over the course of, of, the, of, of this current financial year. We're looking at spending in the, in the, in the, in the order of, of, of over five to 10 billion rand. If we can get a number of our projects uh, off the ground, the investment in the general overhaul, uh, 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 the CEO of TFR mentioned signaling. So it's a major signaling project. We're currently running a, a tender for, uh, for KZN. It's going to be in the order in the next five years, about 5.8 billion. So we have a number of major capital projects that we're investing in to make sure that our infrastructure is really able to meet the needs of a modern uh, rail network and to service our commuters better and to ensure that the right safety uh, prescripts are adopted as we build that infrastructure. But the, 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 the key challenge for us is going to be, once again, comes back to the same thing, security. As we build, we must make sure that we provide adequate security to ensure the viability of the network, but we are we are presently engaged in a number of, uh, of, of of major projects across all the regions from the Western Cape. The Central Line, in particular, is receiving a lot of attention. Uh, uh, the CEO of TFR mentioned once again the issue of encroachment. We've had some encroachment on the Central Line, in particular, which has affected our ability to run a, a, a continuous service from, uh, uh, from 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 Langa into into uh, in, into uh, into the city of Cape Town, Cape Town Station itself. But there's the, 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 these are some of the ongoing problems that we face uh, as PRASA, but it's not stopping the capital investment program. The major thing is to roll these out in a very sequenced manner and to make sure that uh, as we do that, we start to bring trains online in, in, in a number of the critical corridors, in particular here in, uh, in, in Gauteng. We're looking at the next uh, set of corridors that we will invest in the lines, about 12 corridors that we hope to start reopening over a phase process over the course of the next year. Thank mm. you.
Thank you. Uh, just uh, stay with us a moment more, uh, Zolani, because on the uh, point of bringing trains online, a question coming from the audience about when uh, Prasa will start running a 100% service again. Uh, there's a view that there's great demand, especially for long distance passenger trains. So just timelines. Well, yes, the, uh, the mainline passenger uh, uh, train service has, has not been operating uh, as efficiently. It's a lack of, uh, of, of adequate locomotives to do that. We hope that uh, over the course of the next uh, uh, 12 months that we will begin a, 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 a service. It will not be a full service. We will gradually build up to that once we have enough capacity. But we, we also are, are, are concerned about our, 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 our ability to offer a reliable, uh, a reliable, continuous service that's on time and 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 that commuters can trust. So we're not going to uh, we're not going to rush uh, this process. We want to be able to make sure that we can provide a sustained service, not just on mainline passenger, but through for throughout all of the corridors uh, in, in in all the regions. But uh, the, the 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 infrastructure rebuild, unfortunately, is going to make is going to determine. Uh, when, when, when some of those corridors come back, Mabopani uh, and Central Line, which are presidential directives, we're hoping that Mabopani will be open uh, next month in November. The work is, 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 is fantastic. I, I, I spent uh, a few days out there last week. So that work is, is, is virtually completed. Substations, new OHTE and so on are all up and running. And uh, again, to make sure that there's security to, 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 to protect that line. Central line the, the challenge there is the uh, is the illegal squatting as I've just mentioned so 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 the con the intention is to make sure that during the course of the next financial year we gradually move towards that uh, increased services in a number of other corridors where we have not seen as much of an impact on theft and of, of theft and vandalism that we can start to bring those uh, into service and we're looking at that in particular in the Western Cape currently where we can begin to introduce service on a number of the corridors but it, it, it's something that we're working towards that in, in, in the next year we'll see greater uh, uh, greater services across the country and in KZ and in the Eastern Cape which we, we sometimes it's, it's argued that we don't give it enough to, uh, attention because it's a smaller region but we're well aware of that a team was just there making an assessment and on that assessment we'll be able to make uh, plans for the coming financial yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, Sizakele, ma'am, uh, just a, uh, another question. I mean, uh, the, some of your mining clients, ma'am, are not happy. And uh, we see it in the statements that they release uh, regarding now the uh, reduce or reduction in uh, sales that they expect to make going outside of the country because of inefficiencies in moving things out quick enough, a whole host of uh, delays. Just as we are on this topic on improving rail safety and improving the efficiency of the rail network as a whole. Uh, could you just update us on what TFR is uh, doing and how you are working with uh, some mining companies and other companies that need to get goods out of this country to ensure that uh, it's done at a faster pace? Um, thank you very much, Fifi. Uh, but um, you're absolutely correct. And I think I touched a little bit on that uh, um, a bit earlier when I indicated that as a result of the number of incidents of, of theft and vandalism, it is beginning to have a severe impact on what we're able um, you know, to do in supporting uh, very critical uh, customers and specifically, I mean, the, the mining customers who at this point in time, um, if you look at the commodity prices, we, we all would be benefiting, not only just the customers, but the country would be benefiting if we were able to move a lot more a volume, a lot more efficiently. Uh, but the challenge that we have is that in any given day, 24% um, of the trains are canceled as a result of the amount of theft that we're experiencing on our lines. So, you know, there's still a cable effectively, or there's still a cable that, pertain, uh, that links uh, to the signaling system. Effectively, that, what it does is it, it means that if we were planned to run, say for example, um, you know, 14 trains on a particular line, suddenly now because of the delays of having to go in and repair uh, the cabling uh, first before we can rerun, I mean, the trains were down, I mean, to possibly half of the trains that we would want to operate for a day. Because unfortunately, I mean, the rail system is not a system where once you've actually repaired, um, you know, the cable, you can suddenly double the number of trains that you, you, you move on a given day. So whatever is lost is lost. 
And it is a huge, huge, huge problem, um, you know, for us. Yes, I mean, from an, an efficiency perspective, uh, or the things that we believe that we actually can control from our side, there are things that we're doing to try and improve on um, the state of the infrastructure so that that is never uh, the cause of uh, the, the, the negative impact on, on efficiencies. And we've just, uh, uh, right in the middle of our rail re uh, renewal program, that was actually slightly delayed as a result of, of COVID uh, because uh, materials uh, like rails are unfortunately imported uh, from, from other countries. In addition to that, in acknowledging that we have this country problem that we are trying to actually resolve by partnering up with various stakeholders uh, to reduce the amount of, of, of theft and vandalism, We've also started to look at um, the, 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 the ability of us. I mean, uh, we want to see if we can run longer trains in a lot more uh, sections uh, than we have, I mean, in the past, in order to be able to still uh, deliver the, the same level of volume that the customers expect from us. So effectively sweating the asset a, a lot more. And we're grateful that uh, we've been working very closely uh, with the RSR um, in supporting us to try and achieve this. Um, because it does require that for in, in those portions of the network where we, we have never run uh, the longer trains, um, it, uh, test trains need to be run to make sure that the infrastructure is in a state to handle the lo longer trains. And that we have actually uh, then been working closely with the RSR to get the various um, approvals uh, to be able to do that. Um, going forward, we are also looking at the a more use of technology. So we have, I mean, uh, onboard computers on most of our locomotives and we want to see if we cannot actually use that a lot more effectively uh, going forward so that we're not so dependent on um, the, the, the signaling systems that we have um, in the infrastructure today, but we can see how we can bring that onto our systems, which will then assist us that, I mean, when there is vandalism or theft of signaling systems, we can still run uh, the trains a lot more effectively and efficiently going forward. But that is, I mean, something that we're working on. And unfortunately, it's not a solution uh, that we will be able to put into place, I mean, overnight. Having said that, with all of the challenges that we, we um, have been experiencing, we're quite grateful uh, that our customers, and especially the mining uh, customers, have actually opted to collaborate with us uh, to see how we can all jointly uh, try to respond to the challenges uh, that uh, are facing us. And so um, we are hoping that we will start to see real improvements over the coming months. Thanks. All right. Okay, thanks, ma'am. So, uh, Muso, just your thoughts here as we talk solutions and we talk about how we can do things differently to uh, achieve a, a greater result. Uh, the situation around uh, rail and the, uh, the safety incidents is not... Uh, a problem for the industry alone, but a problem for the entire economy, as uh, Cesar Keller has uh, rightly pointed out in terms of lost revenue that could benefit us all. Just in your chair, Muso, uh, how are you thinking of uh, doing things uh, differently and perhaps uh, what role uh, can technology even help the regulator in strengthening its hand? Well, thank you, uh, Ms. Peters. I think it it is critical that as a country, we get back to work. The report that we published does point to issues around security. That is our number one issue that we as a country need to work at. We are collaborating with the major operators and the South African police services through what we call the National Rail Crime Combating Forum, where we do bring in solutions to combat what we are finding through theft and vandalism, and many of these solutions have a technology component. Also, the report itself, when we look at it, there are some positive aspects that we can draw out of it. So what CEO Mzimela has just mentioned around them running longer trains, if you look, if you read the report, there is a decrease in activity levels, both from PRASA and from TFR. Yet, if you read, TFR's results, they have managed to eke out greater profitability. And that lies in what she was mentioning around the longer trains. They're running heavier trains and able to be more profitable. So it does encourage us 
that as a country, we can get back to work. From the Houtrain perspective, as CEO Dax has indicated, their bus service has almost caught up to pre-pandemic levels, which is encouraging because when we look out the window, we can see the highways filled up with cars. And hopefully from a ridership perspective, the Houtrain will also catch up to its pre-pandemic levels. On the process side, we are encouraged that we have seen them make the necessary submissions to reopen some of the lines, like the CEO indicates, the Magopane line, and we're encouraged by that. The report, if you look at it, there are occurrences for platform train interface. These are occurrences within the station precinct where people uh, fall in between the platform train interface. When you think about it in the COVID context, you shouldn't have that because you had diminished numbers. What it does tell us, though, is that demand is there. The fact that we continue to have that, if you were to bring out a silver lining, it tells us that demand is there. And if we allow the operators to get back to doing what they do best, and as a regulator, we don't over-regulate, we monitor what we're supposed to monitor and continue to play our role independently, but we allow them to get back to doing what they want, what they need to do and are good at doing, then hopefully as a country, we can get back to moving the economy and achieving the goals that we want to do as a country. So, yes, thank you, Ms. Peters. No, thank you. Uh, nothing further to add there, and especially just emphasizing the importance of a fully functioning rail network across the entire value chain in aiding our economic uh, recovery. And also, just given the uh, concerns around climate change and uh, the need for all of us to do a lot more, just a faster implementation of the strategy to move a whole lot more things from the road to the rail to uh, help the environment, also something very critical at this juncture. But uh, unfortunately, we are out of time time. I do apologize uh, to the uh, viewers and the uh, attendees who are attending virtually for not getting through all uh, questions. Uh, we'll try and see what we can do about that to get your respective responses. Uh, but at uh, this stage, I would like to thank all my guests uh, who joined in on this conversation with us, uh, Mr. Boy Johannes Nobunga, who is the chairperson of the uh, board of the Railway Safety Regulator, Muso Silaledi, acting uh, CEO of the Railway Safety Regulator. Mr. William Dax, the CEO of the Khao Train Management Agency, Ms. Sizakele Mzimela, the chief executive of Transnet Freight Rail, also, Mr. Zolani Matthews, the group CEO of the Passenger Rail Agency of South Africa, and of course, the Deputy Minister of Transport, Ms. Sindisiwe Chukunga. Thank you uh, very much again uh, to you all at home and in your offices and wherever you were watching this. Uh, thanks so much for, ch for logging in and joining us. Uh, please, however, remember that there will be a follow-up virtual stakeholder engagement session that will be taking place on the 27th of October, so just in a few weeks' time. And the purpose of that session will be to further unpack and engage on the contents, on the contents of the State of Safety Report for the 2020-2021 financial year. Uh, to register for that event, please visit the RSR website on www.rsr.org.za and uh, you can click on the events page there. Uh, details of the engagement session will be available. The, uh, the RSR will also send out invites to rail uh, stakeholders who are on the database of the regulator. Uh, but with that said, have a great day further and we'll do it again next time. Goodbye. <laughs>